Testing, yes. Can everybody hear okay? Everybody's ready to participate, tweet, take notes, engage, yeah? yeah. It's a pretty important topic today. We're really excited to be here. Trevor, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit more and tell us about what you do and where you're from? Cool, um, good afternoon everyone. My name is Trevor Stierman and I'm from South Africa. And my career started um, at a very <coughs> early age. Um, when I was 19, I won the L Star Reporter Search with Elle Magazine, and that fast-tracked my career in fashion and put me in the heart of all things fashion. And one of the <coughs> prizes was to win a 12-month contract with Elle Magazine and to come to London for London Fashion Week. So London was the very first place I came to out of Africa, and um, such a special place for me. And from there on, I, at the time I was studying film at AFTA, did my honors at Chapman University in LA, went back to <coughs> South Africa to freelance, and ever since I've been a trained consultant for Woolworths, which is the biggest retailer in South Africa. I've also contributed to various publications, including CNN, BC, um, and OK Africa, <laughs> and um, Vogue as well, and a Huffington Post. Okay. And from there on, I've went into filmmaking and yeah and I've recently opened up my own gallery and now I'm here. <laughs> All right. Next is Malen Spart Williams. Uh, my name is Malen Spart Williams and um, uh, to describe myself I apply myself in various forms and in, in areas wherever I feel I can impact change or push yeah, the status quo and boundaries, and I use various means to do that, in short. And you've probably seen Malen on TED, TED Talks. Does she look familiar to you? How many of you have seen the TED Talk? Yes, and the rest of you need to get on YouTube right after this panel. Um, okay, last but not least is Abiola. How's everybody doing? Um, I always, it's, it's always strange. Every time I do one of these talks, I always say, should I do my American English accent? <laughs> Or should I just go the other way? Yeah, we can switch a little bit. We can, we can switch it up. I should go the other let's, way. Let's do it. <laughs> um, so my name is Abiola Ake. Okay. Uh, I went to, um, I started my career in banking, um, Nigerian. Uh, worked on Wall Street for about 11 years. I uh, never quite felt fulfilled in that, in that space. Um, someone once told me that the distance between the work that you do and the people that you impact will determine the level of fulfillment that you get. And I was never fulfilled just kind of looking at those spreadsheets. No, no way. I'm not dissuading anyone who wants to <laughs> go into banking or anything like that. Um, but then I had a very uh, wonderful opportunity to uh, run uh, a media company that had been around for about four years. Uh, I was offered an opportunity to be the CEO and publisher of this company called OK Africa and a partner in the company. And uh, since two years now running a media company, I've got to say it's been probably the most amazing time of my life, uh, getting to share, tell stories, uh, authentic African stories all around the world. Thank you. All right, I'll attempt to introduce myself. It's always a little bit awkward. Um, my name is Sissy Johnson. I'm based in Paris. I'm an MBA professor. Um, recently, I taught a course about body transformation and identity, so I'm really excited to have this wonderful panel here today. And today we'll talk about the currency of image, how art, music, film can reframe narratives and identity. So why don't we start with the first question, how do you define yourself, Trevor? Um, how do I define myself? <laughs> Jeez. Um, <laughs> that is probably one of the toughest questions, but it's... It's always so important to, I guess, define myself. But for me, how I'd love to look at it is how do I redefine myself? Mm. Because for the longest time as an African, we've been defined. Sure. So for me, it's about redefining myself. And I would, my way of redefining myself is to portray and, and share an Africa that is progressive, that is bold and beautiful as opposed to an Africa that has always been shown as struggling and, <coughs> and I guess that, that, is, that has so many negative connotations and that, that's me. 
Yes, definitely. So we, I think we can all agree that imagery is very important and we need to be in charge of our own narrative to change the, the image that's, that's out there about us in our culture. And Malens, I'd love for you to comment on that also. Mm, I mean, definitely human first or humanoids, a woman second, Malens third, fourth, I would say uh, a blend of African, Asian, European gene pool, of which African naturally is the strongest in me. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's the most dominant genetic gene pool, you know, so it always dominates and it certainly does dominate in me. And um, then thereafter, yeah, we could dive into professions or whatever, but I. I don't actually like to conform within these frameworks, you know, <coughs> because it takes away so much from individuals. Some individuals may need that. I do not. So that's as best as I can define myself. Okay, Adiola, what about don't you? Don't you hate it when everyone takes all your answers? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, at this point, well, uh, I, I'm really just a, uh, a person learning. I go through my entire life just learning and soaking up information and basically sharing that information in any way that I pretty much you know can. That's that's why. So identity can be defined in many ways, and you know, as Malin said, you know, it could be your gender, your color, your nationality, your ethnicity, and so on. Um, Trevor, how do you use your work to actually change the narrative? Of, of Africa and uh, portray the new narrative? Um, how do I, for me, my biggest platform is Instagram. And on Instagram, I get to, I, I travel both Africa and abroad. And uh, I always share my, my travels. And I share, I guess, style, because I believe um, as Africans, our greatest currency is not just the minerals that we have, but it's, it's our culture, it's mm -hmm. our way of life, it's, it's, it's our great understanding of self and how, how resourceful we are. Because as Africans, we can upscale and repurpose and refashion the minimum that we have. And so I guess my purpose is to share that with the world. And on Instagram, for example, um, Last year, I got a shout out from the official Instagram account, and that for me was my Instagram career highlight. And a week later, I went to Namibia and I shared the Himba woman, um, a video of the Himba woman, of which it was then taken down by Instagram because it did not conform to their um, community rules. And with that, it like kind of changed my work and the direction that I used to take because. At first, I used to just find stylish, beautiful people that are just capture, but then having that from Instagram, I guess that added a layer of, of depth to my work because now, previous to that, Instagram was, was like, we love what you do and we love how you portray Africa. But then I portrayed an Africa of which they did not subscribe to. Mm. And that resulted in me opening up my own gallery and that's how I created my own space where I can celebrate the work that is censored and that is seen as offensive, yet for many it's a basic way of life. And that's how I use my work to capture and share culture and identity. Very good. Malens, how do you use your work and your I'd different platforms? I'd like to platforms? add something to Trevor's <laughs> okay. whole, okay. whole, whole scope because I think how you, from my observation, use your work and what I find distinct is you take a narrative or you take a style that has been what people love to um, describe as appropriation. You know, in a fashion we see it mm -hmm. and as Africans because I feel we were robbed of our identity, at least on the, on the public stage. Um, and whenever it is presented, and we had like a pretty scandal, we we witnessed recently in Paris, Galerie Lafayette oh, yeah. coming, like making a pretty scandalous statement where Africans always deleted from the equation. What I love about Trevor's work is he takes something very raw and distinct, such as the Himba women and their style, and he introduces that on a platform like Vogue in print magazines, uh, such as Vogue and Elle and so on. And I feel I've not seen another African do that, 
you know, in that raw format. And um, I've seen Europeans take it and make it their own without um, giving any credit and reverence, reference, but that is why I am so drawn to your work because you take that, you claim it, and unapologetically um, present it without appropriating it as is, you know, and I think that's, the, you str for me, that's what, what I find the strongest in your work. Thank you, Madame. Yeah. That's pretty <laughs> sweet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And um, how I do that, I think just by existing, you know, I was born in Germany pretty much almost like, it's almost illegal, you know, my existence was almost like outlaw, as outlaw as it could get, you know, people know the history of Germany and, and ethnic cleansing and so on, and when I grew up there, it was like unheard of, unseen of, somebody like me, so I feel my my existence, I, I love to break rules, you know, because I, I got accustomed that I was, I was the rule breaker already. My existence was breaking rules and I do that wherever I can, you know, in, in whichever format I may apply myself um, from, because I feel our responsibility here on earth is to push existing boundaries, existing status quo, because otherwise it means we, we, we where are we going with our society? Which society are we handing over to our future generation? So I envision a world where literally as, as Haile Selassie or, or, or Bob Marley like, um, stated, where, where I will not be defined by this, where I will not be defined by me being a woman. You know, yes, of course, ideally, yes, but not in an oppressive way. You know, where I will be defined by that because it will be appreciated. So. Whenever I can, and I feel I've, I've worked hard in my life to be in a privileged position, I can. You know, I don't depend on nobody to, 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 to pay my salary, whatever. So I can pretty much do whatever I want at any given time and um, pushing boundaries. I do that in the form of art, with exhibitions, with, with also bringing people into context. I work with like 21 street kids where um, their art was exhibited in all kind of um, art exhibitions around the world where, where usually you would not find their work. You know, we had their work in Colette, which is a high-end fashion store in Paris. Usually you wouldn't find them. You'd never see homeless people selling their, their fashion there. You know, so I like to break rules as, as much as I can because the, the existing status quo, the existing system needs to be broken down. You know, it is, it is not rooted in in any noble values. It is not rooted in values, you know? So I feel we need to, it's all of our responsibility to, to, to really break that existing system. And you, as students, you know, where you all have worked hard to, to, to enter a learning institution like this, and you're already set up to be future leaders, you know, you, you need to really, like, embrace that drive and zeal and whatever to break down what is there, not conform with anything, because Presently, as, of so as society exists, we have not formed anything of value, you know? And um, value is, needs to be redefined, and identity, yes, can do that, but we need to, we need to um, I feel we need to break down the existing format because it doesn't subscribe to real values. It subscribes to a capitalist way where money is Unfortunately, it has taken over. Money thus defines the identity of a person, their worth, their value. You know, and a system that is rooted in that is, um, is not a noble system. There's no nobility in oppression in any form. And I feel people are being oppressed. Women are being oppressed for their gender. Black people are being oppressed for their color. You know, it's like too much oppression for the wrong reasons. And all that must be broken down. And I do that wherever I can in my work. And um, you will, you will see some of the same things I'm working on. All right, now, Abiola, can you tell us more about the editorial direction of OK Africa and how you use it to change the narrative? Well, first of all, I've got to say, you know, I don't know how many people read OK Africa here. Uh, you better <laughs> raise your hands now. <laughs> um, I, I've got to say, first of all, it's, it's, it's an unprecedented time to be, it's the best time to be African in the world. Yes. Um, this is not to say anything about the time that, you know, you, know, you know, generations before mine, but I know that growing up, you know, the narrative that I understood, that I got about Africa, the narrative that was fed to me, you know, uh, was not one that was uh, filled with a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. 
right? Um, what I typically try to tell people is that, you know, when, when people say, oh, well, you know, they're giving a, a negative impression of Africa, not necessarily, right? There's p poverty, there's infrastructural decay, there's war. These things are true. But the problem is that there is no diversity about the narrative. That doesn't include the art, that doesn't include the music, that doesn't include the commerce, that doesn't include, you know, all the other things that we find um, in other parts of the world. And I think that what what has happened here uh, today, being, and mostly because of social media, is that we've kind of taken back uh, that control. And we're going to say, look, you're not going to tell our story in an inauthentic way. You're not going to appropriate our culture. You're not going to appropriate our art. Uh, most recently, Damien Hirst had an, uh, you know, an exhibition uh, in Vienna, I think. Was it Vienna? Yeah. yeah. In Venice. And um, you know, it, was, it, it was appalling to see that not only was the representation identical, he gave no credit to the, to the source or the inspiration. I oh. think you, you should explain what was the case, because he took a traditional okay. um, statue, yep. basically Benin. copy pasted, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, an authentic artifact, and um, just it, it's basically plagiarism. Basically. And it was um, you know, a Benin ivory mask no, that he took. It's it's not no, it is. Funny, he, just you know? stole, he just stole it. But, 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 what I think is different today is that in the past, that would happen. We'd lament. No one would hear us. And it'd go unnoticed. And they'd okay. replicate that and do it over and over. And this time was different. Uh, there's an artist who's also a friend of mine, Lao Lucia Banjo. He paint, face paints. And he sent us a letter, OK Africa. And he said, I want you guys to publish this. And he called Damien. Her I mean, that letter was talk about shade and talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we like shade. Like it was, it was great. And, and, and the point about that is that, you know, what we do and what my, my role uh, with OK Africa is to provide a platform where Africans and all lovers of Africa can consume African content and can consume the culture in as authentic a manner as possible. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I'd like to right add here. something, because something that's overlooked, I feel, is why has Africa been represented like that for such a long time? And people feel to, to understand the economic value um, behind that representation that I like to call charity porn. And I feel as Africans, I'm not saying that we did that voluntarily. We've done this out of almost gullibility, you know. Um, we've given too much power to organizations. I'd like to say we hired organizations because we paid a mighty high price to organizations like UNICEF, Oxfam, Life Aid, and so on to run our advertisement campaigns for the longest time. And um, why, why was the portrayal of war starving children so lucrative? Because what people don't understand is like, example, UK has, I think in 2013, around 200,000 200, NGOs. Let's just approximate that 50% of those NGOs work in Africa, yeah? So we're working with 100,000 NGOs focused on that continent, making money, contributing to the British GDP. Because people that work there, let's say on average, have employees between 10 to 100 employees. So we're talking a few million employees. And on average, they go home with a salary that's probably between a few thousand dollars, you know? So just do the mathematics and realize how much that contributes to your GDP. It has no business with mm. Africa. If it wasn't for that starving poster boy, these people would be out of jobs. And that's a substantial number. And that is just one tiny country where we're here today, one tiny island. Because you guys in a larger context, it's insignificant, pretty much. Of course, in the scope and the damage that this tiny island has done over the world, yes, it's significant. But in regards to its scope and positive contribution to the world, it's rather insignificant. But however, the banking, you know, how they capitalize on Africa in terms of really when you quantify that into British pounds is substantial. And that's just a tiny country. If we talk about Canada and America and whatever, how many people would be out of a job? if it wasn't for a wrong identity that they have painted. You know, how much money, how many gazillion dollars were made 
on the backs of Africans. You know, and often these campaigns are shot in the studio. They are not even, it's not even a child that we see. And, and then the whole world is supposed to clap because somebody, like a borehole really, you know, I'm supposed to clap because you, you dug a borehole somewhere, you know, and, and, and 20 cent of that dollar actually, actually um, go to the country. So I feel we also need to dissect why that was done. You know, it was done because it's very lucrative. That image was very lucrative, you know, for the entire world, the Western world. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Trevor, coming from South Africa, can you tell us about your experience being an African in South Africa and being an African out of Africa? You are in London right now, for example. How, how different is your experience here? Um, geez, I think, <laughs> I think in South Africa, um, there's a great level of respect and love from South Africa, but I feel like every time I travel and come back home, mm -hmm. people respect me a bit more because I guess the conversation changes and there's a certain currency that I have as an African outside of South Africa because I'd just be at the airport and just dressed normally as I would back home, and that would always start a conversation, because then I'd look different. I'd somehow, I guess, it's it's very different when you get to like, for example, like Paris, and you this black kid that is decked out in like a printed suit, and it, it people stop and ask, "Who are you? Mm. What's your story? What what what?" What are you doing here? And it, like, I guess that that's a level of currency, and it's it's something that I've come to learn to understand and realize that that's a power that I guess I, I possess, and it's it's I guess as as this um, um, knit piece is my my culture, my inheritance, and that is the inheritance that I guess I've been fortunate enough to inherit, and it comes with a great deal of responsibility and a great deal of, of, of value, and it's something that I carry close to my heart. Mm -hmm. Abiola, can you comment on that also? Which, which part? On your experience in and out of Africa, well, I, I as had far a, as identity. I, I have actually, it, it's, 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 I have a very interesting uh, background. I was born in Nigeria in the 80s, uh, 81 to be specific. Uh, came to the United States, uh, 82. Uh, lived through the entire, um, you know, uh, war on drugs uh, in, in the Bronx, in New York. Uh, then was sent back to, or as my parents would say, it was shipped back to, uh, <laughs> to Nigeria. Uh, and the moment we came into Nigeria, rather than sending us to the city, my parents said, you know what, we want you to get an authentic experience about the culture, so they took us to the <laughs> <laughs> they took us to the village. Oh, yeah, that's, that's quite authentic, <laughs> indeed. Um, where I learned a lot of very interesting skill sets, like, you know, I actually know how to farm. Uh, I can grow corn, uh, yam, you know, don't, don't. <laughs> so, and then um, after that, then we obviously went to boarding school, went that, through that whole entire experience as a, as a kid that used to grow, as a kid that grew up in America, going to boarding school was, had its own challenges, right? Mm -hmm. I was that JJC, you know, <laughs> you're laughing. <laughs> so, she can't relate. Oh, well, she sure actually why. went to high school yeah. with me in Nigeria, so she understands. Um, so I went to the Bells, and, and it was a very interesting experience because I, I had this kind of dual, and then I came back for college, uh, went to Catholic school, uh, finished my last year in Catholic school in New York, and then went to Howard, which was, you know, historically black college. Mm. And so here I've got this very unique perspective of the African American experience in the 80s in New York. I've got this, you know, this, this authentic experience going to boarding school in Nigeria. And then I'm in an HBCU. And one thing that struck out to me while I was there was how much I didn't know about the African American, how much I didn't know about African American history. So taking that, I think. That unique, that unique experience growing up kind of really prepared me for this, this role with OK Africa. And I say that because OK Africa is primarily a diasporic uh, publication, which also seeks to bridge the gap between the African American and the African uh, uh, continent. 
Um, so I think one has to have that type of a unique experience to quite understand how to leverage the platform to bridge that gap. And the power that sure. comes with it, because only as long as we own our media platforms, Correct. as you sure. do, we do Correct. have that power sure. to Correct. tell our narrative. And, and, and that's important because, you know, one of the things or the most challenging aspects of OK Africa was when I came on board, it was run by two white women, right? And um, I had, and, and, and it's not a matter of that white people can't have a perspective that is, you know, that, that, that is attributed to authenticity. Not authentic, but can, you can attribute that perspective to authenticity. But it wasn't for us, hmm. right? OK Africa wasn't for us when I got there. No, it would still be an outsider's look. It's a great intention, but the authenticity won't be there. Exactly. You know? sure. and, and coming there, you know, I said, look, it's, it's got to be this way or not. And uh, since I've been running OK Africa now, uh, we have uh, about 15 employees, uh, an office in Johannesburg, uh, office in New York, an operation here and in Lagos. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're well diversified in a lot of different media uh, uh, entities, uh, different media businesses, including music distribution, eventing, and so on and so forth. But the most important part that I just want to talk about is that bridging the gap, because that is the <laughs> one area where I think we as, uh, as black people uh, have missed out in that severing of the connection between Africa's diaspora and Africa, the continent. Uh, most uh, immigrant groups do have some kind of connection back home, and uh, we've lost that. And hopefully through OK Africa, we can bridge that gap. Good. And other platforms like Afropunk, Trace, True, that are now really, you know, collectively, they reach, I don't know, how many million people do you reach? Uh, well, um, reach 65 million. 65 million. So these, like, we're talking, like, in the billions collectively. And then that's a power, and then that's when a narrative suddenly is accepted because it's not about how true or how false a narrative is. It's almost how many people subscribe to a story, you know, and that's unfortunately how we've, how we've, We've written history, you know. It's just by numbers. How many number? How many people do subscribe to a narrative? That's all it is about. It's never about is that true? Has the Columbus discovered America? Clearly not. However, that is what how many gazillions people gazillion people have subscribed to, you know. So for the longest time, just because the majority of population has subscribed to lies, we accepted that as 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 a and as a, as an accepted status quo, and I feel that needs to change, you know, in terms of Africa. We need to tell a true account, you know, and that can only happen when Africans, and of course African Americans, because they are Africans. What is an American? An American is a native American, you know, and the rest is immigrants there. You know, we have a lot of European immigrants that assume nationality there. And we have, of course, then people brought there through slavery. But ultimately, all these are Africans, you know. And once we understand that a billion people, that is a number, that is a power, you know. And then we're in the position to tell truth and stories, rewrite history. And that needs to happen because we've been propagating lies. We've all subscribed to tell a, the, 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 the tell a tale story for, for far too long, you know. I grew up, I went to the best schools in England and Germany and France and Singapore, what not, all telling me, teaching me lies, you know, and so, yeah, you've been raised in the same manner, you know, let's all be honest. So Columbus is one example, but how much of these so-called facts that we were taught are actually true? 10%, 20, what is it, you know? And um, as Africans, I feel it's our responsibility. Oops, Ooh, oh, we need to, you. To, we need you now. To um, re rewrite history because for the longest time we've we've put that in the hands of liars, you know. And um, I feel it's our responsibility to take it back because we have beautiful stories to tell. We have beautiful legacy. We have beautiful history. We have never heard of the candidates. We have never heard of candidates of Nero defeating Alexander the Great. You know, we have never heard these stories in no history books, and I feel that is what needs to happen. And for me, it's more about that than our individual stories where, where I was born and this and that. Yeah, that's interesting, you know, but I want to know what do we pass on to the future? What do we pass on to the next generation, collectively our heritage? Mm -hmm. 
So prior to the panel, Malens and I and Trevor uh, were actually having a candid conversation about Hollywood, right? And image in Hollywood. And what's actually interesting is that being black or having black features is almost a trend, whereas you will also have, you know, um, black celebrities, you know, bleaching and so on. So do you think one can actually choose their identity? Because uh, in the course that I have, uh, I'm teaching a course in Paris, and it's called Body Transformation and Identity. And one of the main case study was about Rachel Dolezal. Have you guys heard about her? How many of you guys? Can you write? Yes. So... Okay, yeah, let me, can you can you I mean, can you comment on that? You know, I, I find it you know it's 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 funny because it's a it's a paradox of a, of a sort, right? Because on one end we say race is a social construct, right? It is not real. It is fluid. Uh, it is some made up thing like money. So if race is a social construct, can't someone decide that they want to be white? And they can. I think what Rachel Dolezal clearly misses is historical context. And she, anyway, don't, don't. Can we, can we give a little bit of background no, information both about ways. her? We so, have a little Kim and we have a Rachel. You know, one well, chooses to be white and one chooses to be black. Not the same, not the same, not the same. Little Kim, little Kim is not Rachel Dolezal. Rachel Dolezal is, is so just to give a background, I'm, I'm assuming everybody knows who Rachel Dolezal is. Yeah. She's a, a white woman who basically lived most of her life white, but felt that she's identified black. She, you know, went through this physical transformation, got braids as if braids was like the hairstyle of every, and, and then she decided that she was going, she had a senior position at the NAACP, and she was giving lectures as a black woman. She basically, yeah. Imposed, em, you know, embodied everything that she yeah. felt was a adopted black like kids, which is okay. But I'm just saying, yeah. she took it to a whole nother level. She took no, it to I a think whole it's okay level. as long as you explain that this is an identity that you assume. But, 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 the, the, uh, but, but the problem is that when you, it doesn't go both ways, right? And that's the problem. And it's like if I decided that I was going to pass off as white today. Mm. I wouldn't. Yeah, no, like, I, I, wanna... I disagree. There's actually some people that are successful with it, and we, you, yeah, there's this uh, former, what was he, a rugby, whatnot player, like some sports of that kind in the states, oh, and he's so almost sad. white. Yeah. He has straight hair, and you would not. He's still very black to most of no, us. No, 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 no. Blue contact lenses and whatever. And then this lady <laughs> that you showed me in Cannibal, South Africa. Yes. So Af black people do that as well. So I feel but, why can't a white person do it? What I have a problem with with the lie again. I have a problem with lies per se, and I have a problem with at least with with what's the name of of uh, Caitlyn Jenner? We know you were a man before. Everybody knows with Rachel, uh, uh, not. She pretended she was born that way, you know, and then holding lectures. No, that's almost like, that's to me is an imposter, you know, as long as you're honest about it and feel, hey, I can't identify with that race and I'm trying my level best to look something that I am not, then that's fine, but you know? He, here's something that she said, and I would love to have your feedback on that because there's this whole ongoing conversation about, uh, you know, gender and so on. And one of the things Rachel Delizzo said if you can choose your gender, if one can be transgender, one can be transracial. Think about it. I don't know. Think about it. But how many black people do that? And we all clap and applaud. Look at a Beyonce. You know, she is blonde half of the time, and she's she wasn't born blonde. It's not the same. It's, it's not the same. same, but we need to be fair. A little yeah. Kim too. We always say, hey, that was because these we'll people suffered. We'll have a Q and A, guys. No worries. Psychological, <laughs> psychological, whatnot. Da 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 da. In a society where almost being white, because white is generally the color of the oppressor, means freedom subconsciously to a lot that they try to emulate that. Maybe for Rachel Delaware, we don't know her history. Well, okay, let me just, let me just say one thing. Maybe about she also suffered as a child. Let me, let me just say something about, about white being the color of the oppressor. And I think that I think what happens with race, especially as it pertains to Africa, is that we typically try to understand race from the context of American racism, right? Fair skin in Africa, I was having a conversation with this, um, and, and with um, a woman named Mina Salami. I don't know if you guys know her. She's a feminist. And you know, I was talking about how skin bleaching is kind of like uh, an African's desire to want to be white. And, and she said, no, that's not true, right? Is that 
exoticism has something that has always been uh, uh, um, highlighted as a standard of beauty, long before anyone ever came to the continent. And there were times when people would use red clay to have an exotic, uh, they still do it in parts of Africa, uh, to, to, show, to show beauty. I think we run into a problem as Africans when everything we do is some kind of juxtaposition to an oppressor. We, we need to change that narrative. Yes, but I then we need to change the methods Matt, because the one clay and, and, and hydroperoxide, there is a difference. Yes, the, 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 the health you know, mm. impact and all that no, other stuff. No, also what are you trying to emulate with the but clay I don't think that it's, I don't think it's that emulation, right? I don't think it's a matter of emulating to want to be white. I think it's a matter of trying to be different, right? Yeah, but when it's you almost kill yourself, then that because has if you look to at, do with if you, culture. If you look at, if you look at let's, let's look at most celebrities in Nigeria in Nollywood, mm -hmm. right? Tiwa Savage is of the world. A lot of beauty, the, the standard of beauty is still a dark-skinned woman in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Well, right? but they don't subscribe to that, and they know the health implications. They also, it's uncomfortable with that itchy weave that they add, <laughs> and the, the, the contact lens is a whole package. So let's not, let's not compare but, with Himba women covering with red clay. I, let's, let, let's start our Q&A, actually. Do you want to say something? Because I hear you guys. Let's start with you. All right. People that bleach are not trying to be white. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I'm sure there's people here that might disagree, but people that bleach are not trying to be white. Yeah. They want to look different. They want to look exotic. They want to seem as though they have a different sort of lifestyle, but they're not trying to be a cultural definition yeah. of yeah. white. Yeah. 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 So it's just a coincidence that the hair is straight. Sometimes the contact lens is blue. It's just all just by chance. They will not be white, and they can't be white. I mean, that is not what they are trying to subscribe to. And they're trying they're to just be different. Very, we get into this dangerous, counterproductive stage mm -hmm. where we try to say that because people do certain things, they're trying to be something else, i.e. white, because the white is another. That's not what they're trying to do. They want to be different. They want to be seen as exotic. They want to be seen as, I don't know. And how about a healthier but option? they're not trying to be white. There's, what, what, there's so many healthy options. To be different is like the easiest thing on the planet, especially in Africa. You, it's easy to be different. Same thing Why as bleach? People who bound their feet in China were trying to be, I don't know, pitch me from somewhere else. They are not <laughs> trying to be white. That's, that's my I think we, we have a question in the back. Um, Hi, Neil um, Anderson. I'm, I don't think that's actually necessarily helpful. Uh, I think there are some people that actually do have identity complexes, um, and that will translate to their behaviors. And there are others who will actually see it as exoticism. Um, and there, is, there, are, there, there are different motivations. But there is no question, of course, is that there, there are political underlying realities that do relate, unfortunately, to tone. And that is the same in the diaspora as it is on the continent. Um, there is chemical toxicity, of course, and I think half of the problem, I mean, it's a conversation that I've had with Sissy this week, is that the, um, you know, part of the issues with health and beauty is the fact that so much of it is already bound up with Unilever, palm olive, what, et cetera, which is chemical toxicity often, right, in the formulations. And that's just another level of physical toxicity on top of psychological issues. Sure. Right? So we can do ourselves a favor by actually maybe removing some of the toxicities in terms of what we put on our skin, lightening or otherwise. Yeah, I mean, deodorants and shampoos can also be toxic and not lightening, um, as well as actually removing some of the toxicity in terms of how we relate to each other and to ourselves in terms of what we see in the mirror. Um, There's someone in the middle sorry. here. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes, we'll get to you. Thank you. I, I really Hi. don't want the racial factor to Can you hijack. speak up, please? Yeah. I, I really don't want the racial factor to hijack such a brilliant uh, discussion. <laughs> so I'm, I, 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 I want to say to Malens, I, I really enjoy your frankness in this discussion, and the currency of image must really still remain the center of this discussion because what you are doing with OK Africa, for example, 
uh, uh, it's something that needs to be pushed more into our respective uh, countries within the African continent. Uh, you could do us a lot of justice and help us disabuse ourselves from mainstream Britain Woods institutions uh, that have really uh, taken over our continent. Uh, 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 Marans, I, I, I am one of those who have seen your, your TED, uh, and I'm really amazed by how you move within finance, economics, and now art, uh, and still maintain the level of consistency in helping us reject neoliberalism uh, uh, as it is manifests itself in many ways. And I'm, I'm excited, Trevor, I'll follow your work now on Instagram. Uh, as a South African, I'm really ashamed that I'm seeing or hearing of you for the first time. Uh, but I really don't want the racial arrangement to now hijack the purpose of what we're here for, which has been amazing. Uh, that, that, right. Just my two cents. Thank you. We have, we have time for one more question here. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to go back to the Rachel Dolezal case. It's okay. But I mean, if I think it's very important image, because it's pretty earlier today we spoke about intersectionality, and I think that it's important that we talk about uh, what it means to go from one identity to one uh, another identity, how we combine the different beings and the different person that we are. And I just wanted to say that um, in the case of Kathleen Jenner, um, a transgender person doesn't change their gender. They just change the way that they show their, their gender. But in the case of Rachel Dolezal, she benefited from the privilege of being a white person until she became an adult, and then she decided that she wanted to be black and did all the things that went along with it. But I think that for us, people of African descent, people uh, who live in Europe, people coming from very different backgrounds, it's something that echoes with our uh, personal issues and the question that we wonder about. How do we feel that we're free to express the European identity, the African identity that we have, without feeling like we're doing the same thing that we're accusing other people uh, of doing? How do we defend our multicultural identity? Thanks. Thank you. What, can we do one last, one last question? Yeah. One last. Make it good. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Um, my point is uh, more towards uh, the, the artistic aspect of it, and it's directed to, 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 to uh, Stierman. Um, I follow you on Instagram. I've been following you for a very long time. Stierman uh, style diaries, hashtag, um, and all that stuff. Uh, it would be great if you followed me back. <laughs> um, but on the more... I'm a, I'm a critical fan, I'm a critical fan, um, uh, and the point that was being made earlier about the Himba person, I'm Namibian, and the Himba person is projected as the image of Namibia, yet this image of Namibia is the most socially and economically deprived in the country. Um, my question to you, and drawing on to the point uh, that uh, Malens was making earlier about appropriation, I think in as much as the term is bastardized, it is a legitimate point. Um, now, we are lamenting the the fact that uh, NGOs from the West are appropriating or, or, or profiting from uh, African suffering or African art or whatever it may be, um, how do you or how should we, um, not necessarily directed to you, try to then uh, avoid this appropriation, particularly of the Himba person, given that effectively this Himba person is going to get you uh, more likes, going to popularize you, and yet the Himba person is not going to benefit at the end of the day? Mm. Um, with that, I think in order for us to combat cultural appropriation, we should start with cultural appreciation. Ooh. So it's a matter of us retelling that story. And for example, the fact that the Himba already censored on Instagram and they've been marginalized for such an extended period of time, that means that the culture will then soon be wiped out without any trace or then who is to document, who is to archive, who is to tell that story? And had it not been for that, would I be here? Like, the conversation would have been different. And in terms of them benefiting, there is, it, I think it's, it's, it's a matter of a mindset and I guess educating people as well and starting a conversation. And I think that's my role um, to, to be that, that voice, and I think my lunch would like to add. Yeah, because I think why it is important, I understand where you're coming from in regards to the Himbas, but it is important that their story is being told because you have to understand also, in Namibia, 
they're actually the descendants of the Herreros, and the Herreros were wiped out by the Germans. It was a genocide that has not been recorded in our history books, and the Himbas, it's actually a very sensitive topic, and um, it's difficult to talk about because a lot of atrocities have been committed, you know, by my race, because I'm half German, and um, so it's a sensitive topic for me. Uh, because of the guilt and shame that I in part feel, you know, because it's something that has not been addressed. And, 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 and to this day, they refuse to return the skulls that were stolen, you know, that were sent to Germany for experiments, scientific experiments, together with the penises that were the women, the wives of these men were forced to pack and ship to Germany, you know. So I feel the Himba, the story needs to be told because they're the living testimony of these people, of the Herreros, you know, of who we do not know their story, because the story is so horrific and so, like, it's almost too appalling to be told, you know, especially for Germany where they have a narrative of genocide, you know, and that's not the only genocide. We as Germans, and I say we because I partly assume that, that, that guilt, I'm not, I feel it's wrong to shy away from that. It's wrong to walk away from things and wipe them under the carpet. And I would expect more from my people in terms of uh, dealing with that history, you know, because we, 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 we've set a great example in dealing with this kind of atrocity was when it came to the Jewish Holocaust. And that's why I feel it's important to tell the story of the Himba because they live in that way, you know, and, and, and they're the only living testimony to this day you know, the, the, the lineage that extend the lineage of the Herrero, whose voice has been taken away. You know, and would all of you to walk away and do a little bit of research, you know, into the genocide that was committed by Germans there that wiped out an entire people. Well, Malens, I think this was a great way to wrap up this panel. I hope that you guys find it very insightful and that you follow OK Africa, Ms. Malens Bart Williams and Mr. Trevor Sturman. Round of applause for the panel. Please. Um, show my yeah, just wanted to show my appreciation uh, to the panelists. Thank you so much. Balenz has been working um, with me on sort of formulating this panel for a really long time, and I truly want to um, appreciate her and appreciate the entire team. I think the conversation we've had is just testament of the fact that we need to have so much more time to really go into these issues, I think, as Africans, um, as people of color who are concerned about understanding our own identity. Um, 40 minutes was definitely not enough, um, but thank you to the panelists for sort of trying to shed light on this. And I really hope from here we will continue to critically engage some of these questions. So thank you all for your contributions and thank just you. a small thank you. Um, token of our appreciation. <laughs>